In this lecture, I'll cover taxation outcomes in the U.S. I'll begin by discussing the sources of tax revenues and the various ways in which the government spends these revenues. And following that discussion, I'll provide a list of several types of tax systems. I'll attempt to help you think about the incentive structure and outcomes that are generated by various tax systems. Additionally, I'll talk about the size of government as a percentage of GDP, the national debt, and the role of taxation in society. Let's begin by defining taxes. Taxes are payments made by households and firms. Taxes are legally required and imposed by government. It is government that has the exclusive power to tax citizens. Governments impose taxes for three main reasons. That is, by taxing, governments hope to achieve three ends. They are to collect revenues for the purpose of financing government operations and to finance government spending. Two, to incentivize the behavior of households or firms. And three, to alter the distribution of income in a country. Since government spending is a part of GDP, and GDP represents the size of an economy, let's compare government spending as a percentage of GDP across several different countries to see the level to which these countries are involved in the economy relative to households, firms, and the rest of the world via net exports. Today, governments spend large sums of money. While the U.S. federal government spent almost five and a half times as much as the government of the U.K. last year, the U.S. government actually spends less as a percentage of GDP than the U.K. This is due in part to the fact that the U.S. economy was almost eight times larger than the U.K. economy. Over time, the U.S. government's spending as a percentage of GDP has increased, with the most significant increases occurring in the 20th century. Where does all of the money collected by the U.S. government go, and how are these funds allocated? In the U.S., federal spending falls into two main categories, mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Mandatory spending includes all federal expenditures that are dictated by law, which includes programs like Social Security, interest on the national debt, Medicare, welfare, and other entitlement programs. Mandatory spending represents the majority of spending each year in the U.S. Discretionary spending is determined every year by the appropriations process in Congress and is signed by the President. Let's take a closer look at government expenditures. This includes both mandatory and discretionary spending, and a look at tax revenues. These images were created using federal data from 2016 by the Congressional Budget Office, or CBO. Notice that the majority of revenues come from individual income taxes and from payroll taxes. Payroll taxes are deducted directly from employees' earnings. If you receive paychecks from an employer, you'll see several line items on each paycheck, with deductions for federal income tax, Social Security, and Medicare. It is these taxes, paid by working U.S. citizens, that accounts for the overwhelming majority of tax revenues. Notice also that discretionary spending is divided into two categories, defense spending and non-defense spending. Keep in mind that the largest part of government spending is on entitlement programs. These are written into the law and include examples like Social Security and Medicare. And finally, see that total spending exceeded revenues by $600 billion. This indicates that the federal government ran a budget deficit in 2016. Take a closer look at discretionary spending. Education, transportation, health, and other income security expenditures are included in discretionary spending, and these amounts are decided each year by Congress and the President. The annual budget balance is given by the equation tax revenues minus spending. When the government spends more than it collects in tax revenues, a budget deficit results. When tax revenues exceed spending, a budget surplus results. The national debt is the accumulation of all previous deficits minus the accumulation of all previous surpluses. And every year, the government must pay interest on the debt. Government expenditures are financed either through borrowing, i.e. the sale of government bonds, such as U.S. Treasury securities, or through taxation. So how does the government decide how much to tax each person? Well, this greatly depends upon society's notion of equity or of fairness. Let's examine two different notions of tax fairness. The first is called the benefits principle of taxation. This refers to the belief that the amount a person pays in taxes 
should be related to the benefits that a person receives from the government. In other words, the more you receive from the government, the more you should pay in taxes. While this may seem like a fair idea, at least on the surface, the idea has almost no merit in practice due to the obvious fact that the individuals who receive the most from the government receive these benefits due to the fact that they cannot afford them in the first place. Examples being nutritional assistance, housing vouchers, unemployment compensation, Medicaid, and so on. The second is the ability to pay principle of taxation, which is the belief that the amount a person pays in taxes should be related to the ease with which the person is able to bear the burden of paying taxes. While this may seem like the less fair option of the two notions presented, this principle of taxation is the functionally feasible option. This principle further relies upon an assessment of two accepted notions of equity, horizontal equity and vertical equity. Horizontal equity refers to the idea that two individuals of equal economic capacity should have equal tax burdens. And vertical equity refers to the idea that individuals with greater economic capacity should not have smaller tax burdens, which stems again from the idea that functionally, you cannot obtain large tax revenues from those who don't have much to tax, and that in regard to equity, taxing the rich at lower rates than the poor seems unfair in the eyes of most people. Now let's turn our attention to different tax systems and let's discuss the difference between an average tax rate and a marginal tax rate. An average tax rate is calculated using the following equation. Total taxes paid divided by total income multiplied by 100. Under a progressive income tax, an individual's average tax rate increases as income increases. Under a proportional income tax, an individual's ATR remains constant as income increases. And under a regressive income tax, an individual's ATR decreases as income increases. A marginal tax rate is the percentage of taxable income that must be paid for each new dollar that lands within a particular tax bracket. Consider the following marginal tax rates in the U.S. as of 2018 as an example, and keep in mind that the U.S. uses a progressive tax system. The following table shows the marginal tax rates for those that are married filing jointly. Every dollar that is earned up to 19050 is taxed at a marginal tax rate of 10%. Every dollar after 19050 and up to 77400 is taxed at a marginal tax rate of 12%, and so on. Let's consider a fictional example. How much tax revenue would be collected from an individual earning $100,000 a year under the marginal tax rates given in this table? Pause the video and take a moment to calculate this amount. The total amount calculated would be equal to $18,150 times 0 .08 plus the difference between $73,800 and $18,150 multiply that difference times 0.15. Then add another difference, 100,000 minus 73,800, and multiply this by 0.25 and add it to the two previous amounts. In total, you'll get $16,349.50. And what is the average tax rate for the same individual earning $100,000 a year? So here, we're calculating the average tax rate. In this case, we'll take that number that we just calculated, $16,349.50, and divide it by this person's income, $100,000, and multiply it by 100 to get it in the form of a percentage. In this case, this person is paying an average tax rate of 16.35%. Now, some countries impose flat income taxes, not to be confused with a head tax, a head tax would be a constant amount paid in taxes at all levels of income, and a flat tax is a constant or proportional rate at all levels of income. Unlike a flat tax, a head tax is an example of a regressive tax, since the average tax rate actually declines as income increases. Countries with flat taxes, not head taxes, include Jersey, Jamaica, Estonia, Russia, Romania, Turkmenistan, and others. In the U.S., and in many other countries, a question that usually arises in conversations about taxes 
is a question about the top 1% of income earners. How much do the top 1% pay in income taxes? As of 2015, the top 1% refers to those that earn at least $480,930 a year or more. Recall from the table of marginal tax rates on one of the previous slides that the top marginal tax rate was approximately 37% in recent years. The average tax rate will differ from income to income. In terms of total adjusted gross income, the top 1% represented a little over 20% of the income earned in the U.S. in 2015. And this same group paid a little over 39% of income taxes in that same year. And moving down the list, in total, the top 50% of income earners paid just over 97% of total income taxes in 2015. While average tax rates have decreased for all income percentiles since 1980, it's important to realize that half of the U.S. population still, in recent years, paid less than 3% of total income taxes, and that these statistics reflect the outcome of a progressive income tax system. But how progressive is our tax system? To measure this, we use the Stroop coefficient. This graph shows the total population from 0 to 1 on the x-axis, where 0 is 0% of the population and 1 is 100% of the population. The population is ordered by the cumulative fraction of total income earned in ascending order, as indicated by the y-axis. The Lorentz curve is constructed by determining the fraction of total income earned by each segment of the population and then plotting the corresponding points. Similarly, the tax concentration curve is constructed by determining the cumulative fraction of total taxes paid by the population, also in ascending order. The Stroop coefficient is calculated as the tan area divided by the sum of the tan area and the blue area. The larger the value of the Stroop coefficient, the greater the degree of progressivity in the tax system. The smaller the value, the smaller the degree of progressivity, or the closer the tax system is to a proportional tax. As depicted in this graph, the Stroop coefficient fell sharply from 1938 to 1941, but has trended upward since 1970, I'd say almost linearly as I can imagine a line of best fit overlaying the graph. Some economists argue that lowering the average tax rate might actually increase total tax revenues for the federal government. This concept was formally introduced by economist Art Laffer and is best described using the Laffer curve. The Laffer curve is a graphical representation of the hypothetical relationship between the average tax rate and total tax revenue. At a tax rate of 0%, the government would collect $0 of tax revenue. At a tax rate of 100%, the government would also collect $0 of tax revenue because there would be no incentive to earn income. The Laffer curve suggests that there is a specific tax rate at which tax revenue is maximized. In this example, the curve is left skewed, and the maximum tax rate is 65%, which is rather high. If the current tax rate is 50%, then the government can increase tax revenue by increasing the tax rate. If the current tax rate is 80%, then the government can actually increase tax revenue by lowering the tax rate. In this new example, the Laffer curve is right skewed, indicating that the total tax revenue will be maximized at a lower average tax rate. It's also important to realize that individuals and firms with capacity for mobility, that means it's easy for them to move around, may move from one tax jurisdiction to another in an effort to lower their taxes. This concept is called tax competition. You can think of it maybe at the state level, at which different states will impose different levels of taxation, and so individuals and businesses may move around from state to state in order to live in the area where taxes are lowest. As an example, individuals may move from the state of California to the state of Georgia so that they pay less in taxes each year. As a final note, realize that every tax policy is also unavoidably a behavioral policy. When governments impose or even repeal taxes, Governments are also creating an incentive framework that will alter the cost-benefit analysis and therefore the choices made by individuals. And this is the important lesson from economics when it comes to taxes, and that is that society should tax the actions it wants to discourage and reduce taxes or perhaps even subsidize those actions that it wants to encourage.
Policymakers must be aware of one critical point. That is, that you cannot assume that the behavior of individuals will stay the same once a policy is implemented. We must be smart in the way that we craft and implement policies, which also means that we must consider the unintended consequences that may emerge. This wraps up this lecture on tax outcomes. Be sure to download the PowerPoint from the course website and answer the practice questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks for watching. This concludes the lectures for this course, so good luck and thank you for a great semester.